I'll share that. All right. Well, that sounds great. And we are recording this. So um, don't say anything you don't want recorded. I'll try. <laughs> I'm just kidding, of course. You know, like you would do that. Um, now, has Never. the Reading Express been on pause for now, or are they still doing some outreach? Well, I'm going to talk about that. So I'm going to um, save that a little bit for my presentation, but I am going to mute myself and just run and go get some water. So I'll be back. Yeah, go ahead. And for everybody else who's sort of just, just stepping into the room, um, we do have uh, Valerie Bird Fort here with us. She is just taking care of some last minute preparation. Uh, but welcome. Um, there's a couple of people on the list that I don't recognize. So we love having some some different folks uh, joining us for this presentation, which I'm sure will be fantastic. Um, just as a heads up, you know, this is uh, presented by the Library and Information Student Library and Information Science Student Association, acronym is LISA, and we are happy to have anyone currently or formerly enrolled in the University of South Carolina's uh, MLIS program join us. Um, we are making some changes to our constitution, but uh, membership is currently free. So all you need to do is go to Garnet Gate and sign up or drop me or somebody else on the, um, on the list of the board members a line and we'll get you set up as a, uh, as a full on member. But um, this is mainly a, kind of a professional development kind of, but also social and support network for our students. Um, we've actually had some good success over the past, uh, or at least last week, we had some good success with, uh, with another presentation. And it's looking like we're gonna have a lot of virtual um, social events and learning events uh, for Lissa over the next couple of, um, at least in the foreseeable future. So, but thanks everybody for joining us again. We're here with um, Valerie Bird Fort. Valerie is, I looked up some of your bio while we were waiting. You have your uh, MLIS from USC. Your research is in diversity in children's literature, reading engagement, community literacy, and school libraries. You're also apparently a teacher for a while. Is that accurate? That's accurate. I was yeah. a school librarian. Teacher and, I'll, and I'll talk about that too. Okay, great. So, um, and if I'm not mistaken, I saw you teach a couple of classes around Davis every now and then too. Is that accurate? Yes. What kind of classes did you teach or do you teach? So I'll talk about that too, but I teach children's materials, but what I teach in Davis is um, children's literature, which is oh. like the undergraduate version of that class. Okay, okay. I don't mean to give your whole presentation away. That's all right. I'm real quick going to um, email a link to this sure. Zoom room to a friend who's trying to get in and she can't. Of course. Find. Yeah, the, the more the so merrier. I'm not um, available for a moment. I'm gonna... Sure. So, hey, Sherry. Hey, Tamika, Jessica, Laura, Anne. Thanks for joining us. We're gonna start in just a couple seconds. How's this weather treating everyone? Huh? Anna Priya, is it cold down there? <laughs> yes, it's cold outside, yeah. <laughs> so I work at the like campus recreation center as a student employee, so I come from I came from there by walking and it's a little bit windy and cold so I was just like, <laughs> shrinking <laughs> well, stay warm you know cold you, you try to stay warm <laughs> yes I tried I tried my best to keep myself right. warm very good very good okay I'm back <laughs> So um, we're really pleased to have Valerie Bird Fort here with us tonight to chat a little bit about children's literature and sort of how she's been involved with it through the years and through her career. And so without further ado, I guess, take it away. 
Great. So I'm just going to share my screen because a presentation helps me stay focused. Otherwise, I get pretty distracted. And I'm also going to go ahead and give a little um, warning that at some point, there will be a five-year-old coming in here, or there will be dogs coming in here, or there will be a husband coming in here. So just know that that's going to happen, and you can ignore all of them. I, I often do. So, uh, hi, I am Valerie Bird Fort, and of course, I'm with the University of South Carolina, the School of Information Science, and I'm going to talk tonight about Cocky's Reading Express and diversity in children's literature. So I have a couple of things that I'm gonna talk about. And before I go any further, I can see your faces. So nod if you can see my presentation. Do you see Cocky? Okay, great. Um, so um, a little bit about me. So Warren already mentioned that I am a graduate of the program. I graduated from uh, CLIS at the time, it was the College of Library and Information Science. I graduated in 1999 and um, I focused on school libraries and that is what I did for 15 years. I was an elementary school librarian. I've worked in two schools, um, but I have been involved in many districts. So in terms of like professional development and, um, talking with other districts. I have uh, been involved in many. So I kind of know how many districts work, but my work was in elementary schools. And then, um, or during my time working in elementary schools, I taught adjunct uh, for the library school. So I ta I've, taught, I've taught for the library school in some sort of capacity for about, I don't even know, maybe 15 years for a long time. So um, for a while, I was an adjunct. I taught a course that doesn't exist anymore. It was um, 220. So it was a course for undergraduates and it was all about using information resources. So I think we still have a similar course, but it's called something else. I have been teaching um, SLIS 325, which is an undergrad children's literature course for elementary education majors. I've taught that for about 10 years and um, I teach it now and I love it. I taught it adjunct and now that I'm full time, which I have been full time for about three years now, I teach children's materials. So SLIS 756 and I see some familiar faces that have been in that class with me before. Um, so uh, I teach that course and I still teach SLIS 325. So those are kind of the two courses that I teach the most. Um, I also teach programming. I taught it for the first time in the summer and I am on the schedule to teach it again this coming summer. So if it's something that you need to take, uh, think about taking it from me this summer. I also lead Cocky's Reading Express. I know my uh, coworkers, my colleagues, um, Dr. Liz Hartnett and Christine Schillick were uh, with you guys last week and I work with them at the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy. That's where my office is located. And that is the home of Cocky's Reading Express. And I'll talk more about that in just a moment. So I have a picture there of our bus Right now, we're not on that bus very much. I haven't been on that bus since February, but I will tell you what we are doing in just a moment. And the other picture there um, where you see community literacy the most, that is where our office is. That's the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy. Again, Liz Hartnett and Christine Chilik were with you guys last week and they told you all about that program, um, but I'm gonna focus on CRE. And then finally, that's a picture of my family. That's me with my daughter, Katie. She's five years old and my husband, Marty, and he owns music schools in the area. So he, if you are in Co the Columbia area, he owns Columbia um, Arts Academy, which is on Rosewood. He owns the Lexington School of Music in Lexington and the Irmo Music Academy. I am not musical at all. He is. <laughs> so that's just a little bit about me. Uh, I am now going to talk a little bit more about Cocky's Reading Express. So I am the coordinator for Cocky's Reading Express and Christine Schillick, 
um, who was uh, with you guys last week, she was the coordinator um, for many years until she became the director, uh, the executive director of the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy. And at that time, that's when I was hired full-time to teach and coordinate Cocky's Reading Express. So um, this is one part of my job, but it's probably my favorite part. <laughs> um, so what we do is before COVID, we would travel the state um, to date, we've been to every county in South Carolina, and we have given away more than 137,000 books to children in South Carolina. Uh, I'll talk more about when the program was founded in just a moment, but our program looks like this pre-pandemic. I'll show you what it looks like post-pandemic in just a moment. <laughs> Get on a bus. We um, take volunteers from the university. So usually undergraduates, but anyone who's involved with the university can volunteer with Cocky's Reading Express. So we love to have faculty, staff, graduate students, undergrads, like anyone who's involved, we would love to have you volunteer for our program. So we hop, we all hop on a bus and then we go somewhere in the state. Um, our main audience, our main focus is Title I schools. So those are schools that have a high number of free and reduced lunch rates. Um, and we go to those schools. Our primary audience is pre-K through second graders and we read to them. We do an assembly style program. So we've read anywhere to like 10 kids all the way up to 800 kids at one time. It just depends on the size of the school. So we read to them and at the end of the program, they all get a book that they get to keep and take home for themselves after they promise Cocky that they will read every day. So again, we've been around 15 years. It was started as a student body, pro a student government project. Um, so the president at the time, Tommy Preston, uh, at the time there was a lot of discussion. There was a documentary that had just come out of, um, called Corridor of Shame. And it was all about the schools and the I-95 corridor. That's Allendale. Uh, very uh, rural area, very high poverty area. And as the student body president of the university, he wanted to try to do something to serve those schools. So out of his um, desire to reach those students, he came up with Cocky's Reading Express. So that was about 15 years ago. And now it is something that the um, School of Information Science has taken on and we now travel the state, give books away and do all we can to increase literacy in South Carolina. So again, we've given away over 137 books. Um, we are completely funded by grants and gifts and that's a huge part of what Christine Schielich does. I like to say that she does the grown up part of Cocky's Reading Express where she gets the money. She has lunch with, um, with uh, funders. She does like the, the talking, the conversation, the development. And then I get to have all the fun. I get to travel with our students. I get to read to the kids. I get to select the books and um, I get to have the fun part. She calls it, I am the boots on the ground and she gets the money, but I, um, call myself more like a clown with it. So I am um, the person that coordinates all the visits. I have a little video here that I'm going to show you so that you can just get a taste of what a Cocky's Reading Express event is like. There's some images, some video here, and these are mostly made up from visits that we did um, last year. So in the spring, think like January to the beginning of March. <laughs> and then it all kind of stopped. But here is um, what it looks like typically. Whoops, that's not what I wanted to click. That is just a preview of the next slide. Here we are. To dad, aunt, uncle, aunt, dog, fish, read every single day. We're all gonna promise God that we're gonna read every single day. Can we do that? Yeah? Okay, so our cocky's count of three. We're all gonna show our promise. Are y'all ready? On Kaki's count of three. One, two, three. Good job, guys. <laughs>
So those are just some of the visits we've done and some of those things that you saw. We've um, hosted story times at Thomas Cooper Library, uh, not this past summer, but the previous summer we were doing that for like university staff and families, uh, faculty families. Um, we go to the South Carolina State Read-In each year when that happens. We go to public libraries over the summer. So we travel all year long, um, but it is a, a lot of fun and we do miss seeing kids face to face. But I will say that we have had a couple of visits where we've gotten to go face to face this semester. Um, one is we went to the Salvation Army uh, and we did that a couple of weeks ago and they are doing a program for students um, that don't have access to computers at home, need a place to go, their parents work. And so they had, um, it's doing the most good academy and they had no more than 25 kids there. It was K through 12th grade and we did a program for that, for them. And it was a lot of fun. We've also gone to a small um, school called Jubilee Academy and those were children we actually had a six month old <laughs> all the way up to an eight year old and there were about eight of them so um, that we've gone to some places face to face but for the most part right now we are virtual so um, we have a whole YouTube playlist of virtual story times with Cocky's Reading Express and I am going to click here and I won't show you an entire story time, but I do just want to show you our playlist. Um, we have reached out to various kind of celebrities. Um, Justin Crawley is one of our former cockies. We also have uh, Joe Ricker and Tara Parker, who were former cockies. Um, we've got alumni. So, so there are several school librarians on this list. Um, I'm not sure that we have alumni who are public librarians. That's something that I need to reach out to now that I'm noticing that. Um, we also have Tom Riker is on here. Dr. Lankis is on here. Um, our former Dean Beer, uh, Charles Bierbauer is here. So you'll see that we've got a lot of kind of local Cocky's Reading Express, CIC alum celebrities. Also Miss Gamecock, the current student body president is on here, um, Izzy Rushton. Keller Kissam is here and he is awesome because he is from Dominion Energy and they are huge supporters of Cocky's Reading Express. So if you need a story, if you need a smile, this is a great place for you to go. So this is our um, playlist for our virtual story time. So I'm going to try to get back to my presentation here so that I can go to the next slide. So um, all that to say, are you interested in volunteering? I will put a link to this form uh, in the chat when I get a moment, or I'll definitely share these slides with Warren and, and you guys can send them out. But um, if you sign up on this form, you will be added to our email listserv and you will know when we go 
um, somewhere and we need volunteers or I've even sent out, um, you know, I, when I needed help to film the virtual story times, we've done several recorded visits for schools. Um, so I've needed volunteers to record those books that we've read for the schools. We had a special program recently that we recorded where I needed folks who could read in Spanish. So um, you never know what might pop into that email listserv. So if you are interested in volunteering, please fill out this form. And again, I'll share that link in just a moment. And um, we would love to have you. Signing up for the email listserv is not um, you know, it does not tie you to anything. If you can't ever volunteer and you're getting those emails, that's okay. Um, but then at least you'll know about them. Uh, so I'm going to stop there really quickly because I'm about to go to the diversity in children's literature portion of the show tonight. But before I uh, move on, are there any questions about Coffee's Reading Express that I can um, answer for you? And while I do have my slideshow um, minimized, I will share the link to this form to fill out if you would like to volunteer for Coffee's Reading Express. So I put that in the chat. And are there any questions about Coffee's Reading Express? All right, so now, I'll talk about diversity in children's literature. So again, I recognize some of the names um, that are here tonight and I'm so glad you were here. Um, some of this, if you have taken any of my classes before, you have heard some of this before, but hopefully some of it will be new or maybe just looking at it through a different lens. So um, I am in the language and literacy PhD program through the College of Education at USC. And last night, last night, Tuesday night, was one of the last times one of the classes was meeting. And that professor um, shared the idea of a six word memoir with us. And so to wrap up the course, she wanted us all to create a six word memoir. And so this is the one that I created. Um, and I think like just the more I think about it, the, the more perfect it is for me. Uh, and it's teach love through books, save lives. And I really um, believe in this. And so now I'm going to talk a little bit more about it. So I'm going to start with Rudine Sims Bishop. And if you're interested in children's literature at all, you know this name. She is the person who's kind of... Um, connected with the idea of mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors in children's literature. And this is a quote um, that, you know, I'm sure many of you have heard before. And I am going to read this to you. And I have another quote on the next slide to read to you as well. But I think they're all really important. I don't want to just read slides to you, but I think all of this is really important to think about and to hear. Books are sometimes windows offering views of the world that may be real or imagined, familiar or strange. These windows are also sliding glass doors and readers have only to walk through in imagination to become a part of whatever world has been created or recreated by the author. When lighting conditions are just right, however, a window can also be a mirror. Literature transforms human experience and reflects it back to us. And in that reflection, we can see our own lives and experiences as part of the larger human experience. And she ends, or in this um, essay, she states, when children cannot find themselves reflected in the books they read, or when the images they see are distorted, negative, or laughable, they learn a powerful lesson about how they are devalued in the society of which they are a part. So I think this quote is really powerful. And when you think about some of the groups of children whether you're in a public library, a school library, a, if you're a classroom teacher, or just you're moving around in the world, kids are everywhere, right? When they are not seeing themselves in the, in the media, in the books that they read, um, in the conversations that they're having with their families, then they think they are 
um, devalued. They think there is something different about them. They think there is something wrong about them. And this is um, going, thinking about all kinds of things, race, gender identity, um, uh, sexuality, uh, thinking about family makeup, thinking about religion, just thinking about the way you look. So there's all kinds of things that can tie into this um, statement. And there's many reasons, um, many benefits to reading diverse books. And this um, bulleted list is from the website weneeddiversebooks.org, which is an organization that if you know about children's literature, you are familiar with it. Um, it was founded by Ellen O, which who is an author, and she was noticing in like national conferences about children's literature on panels that typically those panels were made up of white male authors. And so she was like, what is this? This is insane. And so um, after, you know, some like Twitter conversation, We Need Diverse Books was, was um, founded. And so there's been a lot of discussion and I believe that it was founded in like 2000. 13, 2014, it's, it's actually not that old, but um, they talk about benefits to reading diverse books. And there have been lots of, um, there's been a lot of research coming out that talks about how there are lots of benefits to reading diverse books. Reading fiction books in particular um, helps you really become more um, helps you have more empathy. But some of these reasons are they reflect the world and the people of the world. They serve as a window and a mirror and as and an example of how to interact in the world. They prepare children for the real world and they enrich educational experiences. Now for a second, you know, we're, we're, I am focused on children's literature and that's my passion, that's my love. But I do want you to think about if you are not all that interested in children's literature, think about the literature you read for yourself as an adult. Is it diverse? You know, maybe because I am so focused on children's literature, <laughs> I, this is in our kind of circle and in our conversations all of the time. But in like adult reading, I don't know so much that, that it is talked about as much. So, so think about that. So some of you may not be, you know, as into children's literature as I am, um, but Think about the books that you read. Are they diverse? What can you do to kind of switch that up? Um, because if you do, if you do switch it up, it's going to make you a better person. Um, so I've got some, some uh, infographics I want to show you. So this is something that chances are you've already seen, but I want you to, um, we're going to talk about it together in just a minute. But this is diversity in children's books in 2015. So this is the percentages of books depicting characters from diverse backgrounds based on the 2015 publishing statistics compiled by the Cooperative Children's Book Center at the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. So the Cooperative Children's Book Center is very similar to the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy in that they are a review center, they get books from publishers, and um, what they do, which is not necessarily necessarily something that we do at skill, but what they do with those books is every single one that comes in, they um, kind of chart it. Is it um, by or about um, an African, African-American author? Is it by or about a Latinx um, author or American Indian First Nations? Like they track all of that. And um, for the past couple of years, they've started tracking LGBTQIA plus characters, authors, illustrators as well. But this is, these are their findings from 2015. So I just want you to look at those for a minute and I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to circle back to this. They have recently released an update. So here's an update from 2018. Um, and here they are side by side. And so what I want to do is just ask you for a moment, like, what do you notice about these two? There, there, there's a lot of information um, that you can gain in these infographics, not just from the numbers, but like an infographic should do. There's also a lot you can get just by looking at the images. So I want to have a little bit of a conversation about this. Like, what do you notice um, when you look at the two and you kind of compare them? 
Yeah, Sherry noticed that it shifted to animals. <laughs> so if you look at 2015, so we had 73% where the books were um, bought or about like white characters and the gender of this illustration is a male or looks like a male. Um, and then, so it did go down in 2018. But Sherry noticed that in 2015, the majority of the book, or they were 12.5% animals trucks, and then it increased to 27%. And that's really interesting to think about, Sherry, how are these animals culturally white? So with the animals, I wonder, like, how many did they track you know, there is a lot of research out there about when a character in a book, in an illust like in a picture book is a monkey, for example. Um, that's usually not a good thing. That's usually not okay. So it would be interesting to note um, how many of these animals are, I don't know, polar bears, bunnies, um, I don't know, things that, you know, unicorns, narwhals not that i consider those animals to be like caucasian animals but like what are the animals that they are uh noticing i think that's a really interesting question and then tamika says white representation went down some african-american increased yeah there is still a long way to go and then one thing that they don't necessarily talk about in this infographic i mean there's only so much we can say, um, and I guess they do kind of mention it. One thing I want you to notice in the, in the illustration, if you look at 2015, they don't show it so much. They do see, like, do you see how the mirrors in both, in both images, the white male character has like all of these mirrors. And if you look in the mirrors, he can be anything. He can be an astronaut. He can be royalty. He can be a spy. Like there are so many things he can do and be. Um, if you look at, um, in particular, like look at 2018 and the 10% African, African-American. If you look at her mirror, what do you notice about her mirror, the mirror itself? Is it okay to speak? Yes, please. Hi, Hi everyone. Um, yeah, it's just her. It's like the exact image of her versus like her being a science, scientist, explorer, rock star kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And do you notice how her mirror is cracked? Hmm. Um, and so like the idea between that is, so when there is an, um, representation of a black person in one of these books what is the representation is it a story of joy is it a story of just a kid um having fun going outside uh playing in the leaves or is there some sort of like stereotypical uh violence happening is there some sort of like you know do they come from a single family home like there's just all of these things to think about like um, when we are thinking about diverse literature, it's not just, okay, there is a Black character in this book. What is that Black character doing in the book? So that's important to think about as well. So um, yes, when you look at these numbers, each one is a little bit better, right? But it, there's still a lot that needs to be done. And it starts with publishing. It starts with um, librarians um, being advocates for these diverse authors in terms of purchasing um, and then seeking out, you know, sometimes the big five publishers, they're not, they're getting better, but sometimes you have to like do a little bit more digging, find those publishers who are publishing diverse books and order from those publishers. Um, sometimes you have to try a little bit harder, but I do think it's getting a lot better. Yes, Tamika, I don't think there is representation of disability in this charge or LGBTQ, but I do know that the Cooperative um, Children's Book Center is charting those things. And, it, and, and very recently have they been charting the LGBTQ um, 
aspect of the books that they get in. So maybe in the next update, that could be something that's included. So I'm gonna talk to you now about some projects that either I have done or that I have coming up and then we will have time for questions and just any kind of discussion you wanna have about these things. Um, so uh, I mentioned before that this is my third year, I guess I'm um, about three and a half years in full time at the um, School of Information Science and as the coordinator for Coffee's Reading Express. And one of the first things I did that first year was I did a diversity audit of Cocky's Reading Express books. And I looked at the books over the years that we have read to students. And I looked at the books that we have given out to students. And I will say that I was not necessarily surprised by these results um, because our books, you know, we're, we're, we've got a lot of limitations. We have a budget. We are completely funded by grants and gifts. We are a scholastic literacy partnership or we have a scholastic literacy partnership. And so I have a catalog of books that I can choose from. And those are the books that I can choose from. <laughs> so, um, and those are the books that in the past, the folks who have been the coordinator for CRE, those are the books they've been able to choose from. So we're limited by budget um, and the books that we have to choose from. Uh, but after like actually seeing these numbers in real life, I have made it a point um, since I have been there to share books that are diverse in our programming. So definitely if I were to redo this diversity audit in say two or three years, which I fully intend to do, I think these numbers will be a lot better because if um, nothing else, I know that I'm choosing books um, by authors and illustrators of color that focus on having characters um, that are more diverse in nature. And then I'm mostly proud of the books that I have been picking out to give away to students. So the books that they get to take home and keep and keep on their shelves, um, those have definitely been more diverse. Um, so that is one thing that I have worked on and I share that with you to tell you, um, some of you are students, some of you are practicing librarians now that a diversity audit is a really powerful thing to do. And there's lots of resources out there to do it, um, you know, on a small scale. I did a CRE diversity audit. So that was a total of like 80 books. That's not huge. So it wasn't all that difficult to read through the books and chart them, um, but start small. If you're a school librarian, maybe start with just like books that you use in a particular lesson. If you're a public librarian, maybe look at like your story time selections and do an audit of that. Um, I just think a diversity audit is really powerful because then you just see those numbers in a concrete way. The Linda Lucas Walling collection I want to tell you about. So um, yeah, oh, hi, Tammy. Um, I do, but I can share that with you at, an, at another time. So I'll make a note to share that with you if, if, or if you'll shoot me an email or if anybody is curious about that, um, I'm happy to share that, but just shoot me an email and I'll do that. So at the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy, we have the Linda Lucas Walling Collection. And this is important in terms of diversity because this collection is all about resources for inclusivity. So uh, Dr. Walling is a retired professor from the School of Information Science. And um, that's her focus on children's literature, in particular about um, diverse or about different abilities, about disabilities. So uh, right now, one project that we are working on, and actually um, Barb, one of, one of the Lissa folks is um, helping with this. We are um, looking to add more decodable text. So decodable books are books that are great for kiddos or for anyone with dyslexia. So I've been looking at some um, research about dyslexia and decodable books are books that really help children learn how to read. They, they, they follow a scope and sequence and they help them 
uh, figure out like phonetically how to read. And then if you can, you know, phonetically make the words, you know, comprehension will come. And so we're trying to build that collection with um, decodable text and resources for readers with dyslexia. So that is something that you are welcome to come browse through and look at the Linda Lucas Walling Collection at the South Carolina Center for Community Literacy. And um, we're happy to, to help you with that. Um, yeah, Sherry, good point. Oh, and I also want to tell you, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So um, Sherry mentioned that some circulation um, management systems like Fala in school libraries will help you do a diversity audit. Also, and I'll put this in the link when I stop talking and, and get questions and stuff, but there is something called um, a diverse book finder. And um, the diversity, the diverse book finder is amazing all by itself. So what you can do is put like, uh, so Watermelon Seed was one of the titles that you saw in that Cocky's Reading Express video. I've put in the Watermelon Seed in Diversity Book Finder and then had a book come up called Watermelon Madness, I think, that um, highlights a uh, family from uh, Saudi Arabia, I think, and they um, talk about, it's still a great read aloud. It's a lot of fun, but it's just more diverse in nature. So I found that using the diverse book finder and I'll put a link in there. But I mentioned that with this because with the diverse book finder, they have um, a tool and I can't remember what it's called right now, but we're gonna do this at skill. Uh, and they, it basically will do a diverse, book audit for you. So I will definitely put that link in there. Um, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, other projects that we have um, or that um, I can tell you about. So Bilingualism Matters Library. This is a library that is at the University of South Carolina. It has been around for a about two and a half years, I think. And it is through the College of Education. It is housed at Bright Horizons at USC. You can see a picture there. Yes, Tammy, exactly. The collection analysis tool, thank you. So she put a link to that. That is free for any library in the United States. Um, uh, you just have to fill out a little form and then they'll look at your library and then you'll get an approval or not. We just recently got approval and we just haven't had a chance to do it yet, but basically you upload your mark records and then it will analyze your collection. And so I am very excited to do that with the skill collection. But Bilingualism Matters, again, it's at Bright Horizons at USC, which is um, the Yvonne, let's see, I gotta hide the chat here so I can get the name right. It's at um, the Yvonne and Shiler Moore Child Development Research Center. And um, I am helping with this center. Uh, some of you may recall last semester seeing a call for volunteers or an independent study. They really need volunteers and help cataloging that collection. So if that's something you might be interested in working on, please let me know. Um, they use TinyCat um, to catalog it. Uh, very user-friendly, intuitive, um, but it is a center with various books in different languages. Uh, so they've got German books, they've got French books, books in Italian. I know that they want to build that collection to have other languages as well. So, um, and I know they want to have some different programming. Uh, I know that we're planning on doing some story times in different languages and all kinds of things. But so this is another uh, opportunity to explore diverse literature at the university and I can help you um, help them. So let's see, I'm going to go back to where I can um, see the chat. And I'm almost done, I promise. So if you, um, did I have, okay, so yeah, I'm going to get back to a future project in just a moment. But if you want to learn more about any of the things that I've talked about, in particular, just diversity in children's literature in general. I've got some really great links and blogs and folks to follow on social media. Again, I'm really happy to share this presentation so that you can get these links. If you've taken one of my classes before, chances are you know about these folks, um, but they are all really important um, to follow. So before I get questions, a future project that I am working on. So again, um, I'll say that I am currently in the PhD program at the um, College of Education and Language and Literacy and my research focus is on LGBTQIA plus 
books in elementary school. The reason that I am focusing on that is because when I do presentations to school librarians um, around the state, which I've done a lot of diverse book presentations, um, in particular, my elementary school friends, when I, when I ask them, you know, like, so Dr. Spearing, Dr. Jenna Spearing and I did a presentation for a, a local district's um, entire, uh, all of the librarians, K through 12. And so we had them all look at the Stonewall Award winner. So Stonewall is the award that is given to excellent LGBTQIA books. And they have a, an award for young readers. They have an award for middle grade. They have an award all the way for adults. So there's definitely books on that list for K through 12, right? So we gave them that list and we said, look up what books you have in your collection of what's on this list. These are award winners. These are you know, excellent books in terms of like looking at selection tools, looking at reviews. These are books you'd wanna have in your collection. Again and again, in the elementary schools, they did not have any of these books. And what I was most like, uh, yuck with, is that they seemed okay with it, that they didn't have any of the books in their collections. And the reason was that the um, conversation was they wanted to spend their money, granted, no one gets a lot of money, especially not school librarians, um, but they wanted to spend their budget on getting books that looked like their students. So they wanted to focus on having books that were about brown and black characters that were about different, um, you know, just books that looked like their students. Well, my feeling about that is, first of all, you can't look at someone and, and know what their sexuality is. You can't look at a child and know what kind of home situation they have. You can't um, look at a child sometimes and know what they identify as. Perhaps they look like a little girl to you, but they identify as a little boy and they don't know what to do with that. And if they could see themselves in a book that you're reading to them, that would be huge. That would be so powerful. And going back to my six word memoir here, um, if you read books that really show um, everyone, no matter what it is, race, gender, sexuality, religion, you could really save some lives because the research shows, especially in regards to LGBTQIA folks, like, you know, they're, they're, they have a high death by suicide rate. And if we can teach them young to just be empathetic and more caring and to show love to people who are not like them, then we, we could save lives. So um, that is really like my main focus right now. And I've got some projects, just ideas um, that I hope to follow through with in terms of that, but that is um, what I am working on. And I'm going to go back to, I hope you're not dizzy by all this. So I'm just going to go and um, that's my contact information. So you can definitely email me if you need anything. I've got my website there. I've got all the social media there. Again, I will share this presentation so that you can have it, um, but I am going to stop sharing and then just um, take your questions. Jump on in there, folks. I can get us started, Valerie, if that's all right. Sure. And then too, before you, before you do that, I am interested just in the chat for the folks that are here, um, just to let us know who you are, I guess. Sure. I recognize quite a few names, but. No, um, I, I'm curious as to how you're, that the breakdown of, um, of uh, sort of diverse characters in children's literature, uh, the slide you put on that we talk so much about, how does that reflect as far as the uh, the people who are authoring these books? I mean, is it a similar, is it a similar correlation? And also, you know, if, if it appeared as though the black girl was looking at a broken mirror as if her reflection of herself is flawed in some way, isn't that how 
Isn't that the author depicting it that way? I mean, what are we supposed to do with that? That's, That's a question. really interesting question. So speaking to like authors, yes, publishing, I think they are trying to trying to do better. Um, there's a lot of new like imprints coming out where they're specifically working on publishing diverse books by diverse authors. And there's a whole conversation about own voices where like, so if I am writing a book and the um, main character is a black man, that I am not, I don't know that experience. <laughs> I don't walk in those shoes, right? So there is um, a lot of talk about like, why should I be getting the money from publishers to write that book when for sure there is a black man who could write a better book because he lives that experience. So I think publishers are, are working on that, but that's when you, when you hear um, talk about own voices, that's what they're talking about is like the, the people um, living those experiences, writing those books. Right. So, so it's like sort of just to kind of directly correlate, you know, there's a 20%, 27% of the authors are, are African-American. And again, so they're writing about these issues though. So their subject matter. Well, <laughs> well, I don't know necessarily. I'd have to look at their numbers, but I don't know necessarily that those numbers are, you know, always tracking a black author who's writing a black story. You know, these are just the, the authors. Yeah. Um, so it could be um, a black author writing an animal book. It yeah. could be, you know, so I don't know necessarily. And it could be that there's um, white authors writing about a black experience. So I don't know necessarily in that statistic sure. that I showed that that's what they're tracking. Sure. Um, would you say that this, those kinds of, these kinds of pushes for diversity though, and diversity in not just the subject matter, but the authors is having success? I think so. I think it's really small. I think it's, right. it's, it's um, moving slow, yeah. <laughs> but I think it's getting better um, personally. I know that you know, if anyone else wants to jump in with their thoughts, you know, I'm happy to have a, a conversation because I'm certainly not, uh, it's my passion and I'm really interested in it, but I don't, um, you know, I still think I have a lot to learn just like oh, anyone yeah. else. Yeah, all of us do, obviously. This is kind of, uh, this is all, this push to divert for diversity as old as it is, you know, um, and uh, going back to, I guess, you know, abolition, um, you know, we're still just making baby steps, but uh, but at least we're talking about it here and right now. Um, it's unfortunate it took so long. And I think some of it can be really hard, in particular the the current research that I'm trying to do um, with elementary school and sharing LGBTQIA characters in, in South Carolina. You know, a lot of uh, school librarians, classroom teachers, they're just very they're uncomfortable. Sometimes it doesn't, it's not, they don't, they don't even agree with it at all. But I think as librarians, that's something that we have to try to wear different hats and we can't um, put, you know, we can't, we have to be, uh, Cornelius Minor is an educator who I follow and he, I think is a classroom teacher or, or a principal, I can't quite remember, but he said it perfectly. He said, we need to be radically pro kid. So I think the, the most important thing that um, librarians who are serving youth need to focus on are the children that we're serving. So it might be that we, we are afraid of what the parents are gonna say or the caregivers. We are afraid of what our principals are gonna say. We are afraid of what our supervisor, supervisors are gonna say, especially if we're like in a small public library, but we can't be afraid of the other adults. <laughs> I don't think we have to like do what's best for the children we serve. Absolutely. You know, Valerie, one of the um, kind of spin up what Warren was just talking about, some of the classes that I've had where they, 
the assignments have asked us to explore diversity. It's almost like connecting um, the auditing process with the project where you're learning how to locate diverse materials. And with the upcoming winter holidays, uh, there have been a couple times when I've done some similar to lib guides, similar to the selection assignments. You know, I'm working on one for your class right now. And it's really difficult to find uh, a lot of options for winter holidays, things that happen over the winter. People always say Christmas, and I find that a very non-diverse term. And so I just say winter holidays to refer to that one section of time where we have a lot of celebrations. Try to find great books on Diwali. Um, try to find great books on Kwanzaa that represent um, a range of ages and things that are family oriented as well as geared toward early readers, middle readers, you know, high school to adult. That's actually a hard look. Mm -hmm. And oddly, some of the best things I found were much older in what I call vintage. Beautiful recordings, for example, collections of music and recipes and um, really rich, really rich material. But I can't find recently published equivalents. And that puzzles me a little bit. So to me, it kind of all folds under that concept of diversity and then accessibility. And I noticed in the chat when people were responding to you about who you are, what you do, we've got some librarians from Richland, Maine. And well, I would love to hear what Leslie has to say, because I will say before she talks, like she's just one of my my favorites and someone that I've learned so much from. Um, but yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts, Leslie, and I think everyone else would too. That and cataloging. Leslie, I, um, I was hoping that one of you would talk to me about where do you actually put all these books that Valerie's been talking about? How are they cataloged? Where are they placed in the children's section, in the YA section? How are they discovered? Because I remember being inside Richland, Maine in the children's section one day and watching, it was always it seemed to be moms, helicopter moms, you know, who were doing all the picking and choosing. Um, I'm just curious, you know, where's the, where are the books placed? It's not, do you have a section? Are they just set in there? I'll just be quiet so you can tell me. Well, Valerie, you're so sweet and I miss seeing you. And um, I'm glad that Marty is just so famous and I just hear about him so much. <laughs> and I miss seeing you, and Katie, right? Yes. Yeah, she's so cute. Um, and Jess Bingham is here and she is our, um, children's um, collection management librarian and she selects the materials um, for years and years. Um, that was the responsibility that I had and then we were happy to hand that over to um, the collection management department. So Jess Bingham is here and she goes by Jess but she's showing up as Jessica Bingham. Um, and um, Ann Katz is also here from the children's room at the main library and Ann is um, a recently hired children's librarian has been in the children's room for a couple of years now in a couple of different capacities and I said you should go to library school so she just graduated from your program at USC and um, is just a gift to the community and to the children's room for sure and we're lucky to have both of them and so I'll just say and try to talk as fast as I can because I could go on and on about all this but I mean I do think things are looking up when you look at the board books that are available for babies um, from the um, Vashti Harrison books, the Little Leaders book series, and just um, the um, books with African-American babies in them. I mean, you know, back in the day, I mean, I started at the library in 86, and really board books were just Tana Hoban and Helen Oxenberry, and, you know, it was either images or, I mean, Helen Oxenberry was smart enough because she's brilliant to put black babies in her books with those big, beautiful faces, but there's just more to pick from. So, and Jess was on a committee, and I think she was, and she'll correct me if I'm wrong, to audit our collection with um, Heather McHugh and a bunch of other people who work at our library and look at the whole collection of the library to see in terms of diversity, what we have, what we need to buy more of. And all of a sudden, we started getting more multiple copies of African-American books, you know, um, um, Hair Love, 
um, and just, you know, other things that are new that we started getting more copies of them, which is great because the thing about it is, is when you have less to choose from for children that reflect the black community and we have, you know, over, well, at least half the children who come in are African-American and you want to give them as Augusta Baker always said, you want to give them to white children too. I mean, it's not like you just give the black folks to the black kids. I mean, that would be weird. I mean, you want everybody to see everybody, but, um, I think that um, there is more to choose from. And um, I think that there is a way to make sure that they're visible. So we have bundles of books in the children's room when we were open that were, um, and I always had this kind of rule about the different topics that could be in these bundles of collections of books on top of the shelves to sign um, that advertised them, that they were of a genre or of an interest. So I always said, you know, we have to have at least two to three African-American bundles and an Asian bundle so that we were always bringing attention to those books. I really am not in favor of let's put a purple dot on the black books and a blue dot on the mysteries. And I, I live that life and it's very limiting. It's like AR in school. It's the kudzu of librarianship. I absolutely abhor it. And I think that it just does people in because, you know, it says you have to look at that shelf and you can only read those books if they have those stickers. And it's just why, why would you do that? The world of literature is so big. Um, and yes, Jess is right. We always have we also have the diverse book club sets for families and that's fabulous. It's a bag of 18 books and it includes a diverse grouping of books from picture book, board books, picture books, nonfiction and novels that a family could use, especially if they had mixed age children to check out that one group. There she is, that's Jess. Um, and so it's just very, very helpful. And I think that, you know, the beauty is in the serendipity and you know, I spoke once at ALA and these librarians looked at me like I had three heads when I said, you know, everybody who comes in your space, you should approach them if they don't approach you and you should offer to pick out books for them and you should put books in their hands. Even if they say no, bring them a stack and just say, these are some of my favorites that I think your child would like and that you can take or not, but you don't have to pay for my expertise because you paid your taxes and you get it for free. So you might as well take advantage of it. And they were like, well, we never knew we were supposed to do that. So I think librarianship, and I say that for Nicole, who's here, needs to do a better job. You know, the president of ALA talks about advocacy, advocacy. Well, it starts right then and there on the front lines. And the way they feel about librarians and the way they think of us has everything to do with, you know, our funding and whether we stay alive and whether we can buy more copies of books. So you have to go out there and you have to, you know, be in love with the books and in love with the children and take them a bunch of books and put them in front of them and say, these are really great, you know, you should at least look at them and consider taking them and be a little pushy. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I think librarians, you know, there's this famous librarian, um, Frances Clark Sayers, I think she was the one who said, we need to be the belligerent profession where we're more belligerent, you know, and we fight for things. And I think we say it, but we don't always do it on the front lines. And so next time you walk in a public library, whenever that will be after COVID, see what they say to you, see if they offer, see if they offer to help you pick out books, see if they bring you books, see if they're advocates, or if they just say, let me know if you need anything, because that doesn't mean anything. So I think it's up to us to do something about it by having bundles, by you know, putting books on display, face facing out, by having a collection management librarian who will buy more copies of things that are diverse. And, you know, I mean, you may not need 10 copies of the Gloria Steinem biography, which is great and won a lot of awards, but you just may need more of other things. And the only last thing I want to say is that if you look at the Caldecott and the Newberry last year, I mean, it celebrated the Black experience more than it ever has. I mean, it, it was just amazing. I mean, between New Kid and you'll have to help me out, all of you, um, and uh, The Undefeated. I mean, the, you know, it was just, I think Roger Sutton wrote in the Horn book, and if you don't take it, I suggest that you definitely subscribe or read it online. You know, everything that won was by a Black author and was celebrating diversity. So, you know, um, Ibram Kendi and all of this attention has brought more and more attention to it. And Sherilyn Wade Hudson started that you know, um, that uh, publishing company long ago, it's been around for a while, but the hashtag we need diverse books didn't start, I think it was like 2014. So, you know, it really brought attention to it. And, but then you've got Diane Johnson who lives right here in Columbia, who's got books that are out of print. These are out of print. And so it's just, you've got to do things like write to the publishers and try to get things back in print, demand them, order them. If they know that they can sell 10,000 copies, you know, then they'll, 
publish it, but if they just have one librarian, it has to be like an effort. And I think it's really improving. And I think that the Asian experience and these awards, the Asian Pacific Award, the Stonewall Award, the Native American Award, the name escapes me. I mean, all of these things, Small Fry won a lot of awards, you know, they really, it's helping, but it's not as good as it could be. And yes, there are still more books about animals, which is, you know, shocking, but it is better than it was. And I think the place that I'm most worry about are, worried about are for the like first and second grade little boys who are African-American that don't throw it to Mo Boys by David Adler. I mean, there's just not a lot of that. You know, there's not a lot of really good books that aren't um, just kind of, um, I mean, Roscoe Riley's fine, but they're just not, they're kind of silly, that are fun and that are not incidental, but that are purposeful and really good for them to read. So that's all I got. Yay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else oh, have just have anything to share or any, any questions? Yeah, I have a question. It's Tamika. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, with COVID-19, do you see a rise in children's literature going towards hygiene? Because I'm starting to see that, like wash your hands and wear a mask and those type of preventative measures. Um, and also, uh, going back to the African American authors, I know on Netflix, I think it was in September, mm -hmm. they had the program Bookmarks. Yep. So they, they featured like African American celebrities just talking, uh, reading the African American authors' books. So, yeah. So, um, uh, about like COVID and hygiene and germs and hand washing. Like right at the beginning of the pandemic, there was actually, there was like a rush of all these self-published um, COVID books I was noticing. And there was one, a lot of them available online for free. And there was one in particular, I know the publisher is Nosy Crow, but I can't remember. I think the book is just called COVID-19 maybe or coronavirus or something. And it's actually really good. You know, a lot of times like there is definitely a, a trend right now. <laughs> Um, and some of them are good, some of them are not so good. Uh, at Skill, where we get new books, uh, we did recently get um, a board book that was called Germs. Um, but hand washing and germs is just one of those things I think that is um, kind of typical in children's book world. So I don't know, like there's definitely been some COVID-19 books and coronavirus books, but I think there's always been hand washing and germs because that's just one of those things that we want to teach our, our early readers, you know. Um, and then also going back to bookmarks. Yeah. And that's a fabulous series. If you have not watched it, it's on Netflix and the host is Marley Diaz. And Marley Diaz, I'm not sure how old she is now, maybe like 16, 17. But when she was, I think, 11, she was noticing in her um, school that she was uh, reading a lot of great books, but none of them were uh, with characters that looked like her. So she's a young black girl. And so she started a grassroots effort with her mom and they wanted to collect 1000 books that had main characters that were um, young black girls. And she had a hashtag and everything. And um, she now has this like amazing um, she's an advocate and also on YouTube, we also found that she um, kind of uh, uh, says that Augusta Baker is one of her idols. So uh, that's on YouTube. Uh, we'll, we'll find that and we can share that link with you all. But uh, that was really interesting um, that she knows who Augusta Baker is and talked about Augusta Baker in an interview. But um, uh, the bookmarks on Netflix, it's all... African American authors, illustrators, um, celebrities reading books by African American authors, and it's really great. And they're really short too, so um, you know it's it's a picture book read aloud. So it doesn't take a lot of time to watch, but it's really great. Who else has a question for Valerie? Valerie, have you seen the Ibram Kendi board book, How to Be yes. a 
Yeah. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and Nicole's too on, um, there's one called A is for activist. It's, oh, maybe seven years old. And we moved it from board book to social science because I just struggle with board books because I feel that, you know, I know that older children will read a board book, but I guess I'm stuck in the hole that board books tend to be for babies. And I just struggle with having it in the board book section because that's where people go, you know, and where we urge them to go to read um, books for babies. Well, I think so. Anti-Racist Baby by Ibram Kendi. What I love that they've done about it or with it, the publisher, is that they have a board book version of it, but then they also have a picture book version of it. So um, that's really great. So then you just shelve, shelve it relative to what it is, right? <laughs> to what the format is. So you shelve the, the board book one. And an Anti-Racist Baby, um, it's just, it's a really, it's not... Um, you know, like A is for activism. I consider that like if, if you put uh, board books into like fiction and nonfiction, like that's definitely like a nonfiction board book where it really kind of talks about advocacy and um, social justice, you know, where whereas Anti-Racist Baby, I think is just a, a nice book about, um, or not nice book, but you know, it can definitely serve both purposes. So it can teach about social justice, but then it's also a lovely book for a family to read together. Um, so well, I don't why know. Why do you think he felt the in, need to make it a board book? Or wonder, who made, or, or why, I mean, why is it trade and board? Um, maybe, who knows? Um, anti-racist baby maybe they considered it since it had baby in the title that but then if you think about things like boss baby not every book that has baby in the title is then a board book i assume um, it's partly about money well, i mean the publisher you know it's just like the covid question i mean you know <laughs> you know books reflect our time and art reflects life and so it's a good time to make some money writing some covid books for children exactly. I mean, what could and be better too, okay. if you think about um ibram kindy in particular um the, with the popularity of stamped from the beginning and stamp the remix like the publisher oh. i'm sure was like hey um let's do something for children too and then because it is a book i think that works as a board book but then also works as a picture book <laughs> why not publish it in both formats? Yeah, so I, I mean, we had him speak at our, our library and I think he's amazing. And I, I mean, his book was the first book I read when I was really digging into anti-racism as an idea, um, that and um, uh, white fragility. I mean, there, I mean, there's just so many good things out there and I think he is brilliant. Oh my God, I think he's totally brilliant. And I love the book he did with Jason Reynolds. I'm just struggling with the fact that it's a board book because I just think of board books for babies and, but I'm probably overthinking it. And I mean, you could read it to a six month old and they just hear the beautiful words and that's all they need to hear. And that's yeah. okay. But it's just odd to me that it was a board book, just like A is for activism was odd to me that it's a board book. And it was a board book first. So that's, you know, that's interesting to just think about too. Yeah, Anne is right. The text is a higher level. I mean, it work. I think it, it's better as a picture book. Um, so yeah, it's just it is interesting. Publishing is interesting. <laughs> Can I ask a, a little bit of a tangent question? Yeah. Um, okay, so I have a six month old right now, and I know from all my training that we want to be reading the the baby's board books and getting them from the library. But honestly, she just eats everything. So how do I do? I just wait or like have someone else hold it across the room? Like, how do libraries deal with this? Because like anyone that needs a board book is probably going to eat it. Go buy some board books that she can eat. Maurice Sendak said that is the sign of a love of a book is a baby that will eat it. Uh -huh. I mean, the fact that the baby wants to hold the book and have it near him and, you know, I mean, it's a great thing, Tammy, you should be super excited about that because that means that that baby is embracing that book and it's so tactile, the babies, everything's so tactile. So, I mean, no, I would never put it out of reach. I would, you know, get those touch and feel, you know, those things that have the flaps and everything and just dig in, come to the library. We will never charge you for books that you destroy. Yep. Thank exactly. you. Exactly. 
Valerie, I have a question. Yes. So um, one of the things that I am interested in is like some of these a little bit less academic take on some ground level, line level situations that come up. So I'm not really sure how to formulate my questions and I'm just gonna talk my way through it. So let's say you as a newly minted MLIS holding youth librarian, go to one of these rural counties and you say, I am here to make a difference. Like we're all excited and you say, I've got this list of anti-racism, pro-LGBT books that I'm ready to, I will spend my own money on to get them into this library. And the whole entire community stops, comes to a screeching halt and lines up against you. I mean, you know, what are some strategies that you could tell us that are have a practical usage or some language we could use to sort of start this conversation and, and have positive outcomes? Can you address that or have I not been specific enough? Well, no, I know for a school library setting and maybe the public library folks can can pipe in for um, public library because it is a little different. Yeah. So in a school library, um, if someone has a complaint about a book, so first and foremost, you, you purchase books using your selection policy. You have a selection policy in place. You have that in writing. Um, and so you always have that to kind of go back to, right? So these books may have a certain number of positive reviews. Um, I have read all of these reviews. The, the, this is why I know this is an appropriate book. Here's how it relates to academic standards and, and et cetera, et cetera. If a person comes in and they definitely still have some sort of issue with it, even after you've showed reviews and whatnot in terms of a school library. Um, and I'm sure public libraries have this too, but like at school libraries, there's going to be a materials challenge um, procedure to go through. So like if a parent came to me and said, I really don't think this book is appropriate for um, this elementary school library, I want it removed, I would say, okay, well, here is the procedure. You have to read the book, you have to fill out this form, then we have to have a meeting with the principal, we have to have a meeting with a committee, and it goes through a step-by-step -step process that is all in writing, that is all in a board policy, and it, um, you know, there's a step-by-step -step procedure. And so you are protected by a committee, you are protected by the fact that you made your decisions based on a selection policy. Now, you know, that goes also to coming to thinking about some selection policies might not be as inclusive as others. So that might be the first step as a brand new librarian is to make sure that you know what your selection policy looks like. And if some changes need to be made, that you go through those um, procedures to make those changes to make it more inclusive. Um, but you, you need to know the policies in place, you need to know the procedures. And then again, just going back to what I said with what Cornelius Minor um, said that you have to be radically pro-kid and you really have to uh, remember who you're purchasing those books for. I think that kind of helps with um, kind of staying strong and not being like, well, if, you know, I, I don't even want to get into it with that parent. So I'm just not even going to purchase this book because I know that that happens. Um, I don't know in terms of like public libraries, what that procedure looks like. Right. Well, I'm imagining there are probably certain similar procedures for oh, that. For sure. but, uh, but I'm really, what I'm more concerned with, or what I'm also concerned with is if this pushback is coming from the director of your small rural library. And it, and it could. So yeah. that's a conversation to have. And I know like as someone who would be brand new on the job, might not feel comfortable or um, secure in your position to kind of right. take a stand. But then again, you have to remember um, who you are there for. And like Sherry said in uh, the chat at her school, what she would do is um, discuss allowing that parent to control what their own child checks out and not necessarily what everyone else's child checks out. Mm. It's a good workaround. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Who else has some questions? We're uh, we're running into uh, we're about an hour and fifteen here, so we yeah. can't spend too much longer. But it, let's, this is a great conversation. I'd love to keep it going all night, but I know we got stuff to do. <laughs> I yeah. got a person that needs a bath too. Yeah. So. <laughs>
<laughs> Who else has some questions for Valerie? Well, maybe one wrap up. Valerie, you've always been responsive. So I'm sure that any of us can reach out to you after the session. Definitely. Um, and the coming. Okay, I'll, you know, I'll put my email address in the chat um, in case anyone needs it. Wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, one of the things that I have just absolutely loved about my experience, and Valerie, I graduate in December, so I'm almost done. Here. I got <laughs> days away. One of the most important things that I would want to impress upon someone thinking about coming to school here is how accessible and helpful our faculty is at, um, at Davis College. Um, there's just almost nothing they wouldn't do for you. They're generous and giving and, and their, their time, which is so valuable. They never hesitate to, to stop and chat with me and make an appointment with me. And, you know, different professors who I've never even taken their class uh, will invite you by to come chat about whatever issue you may have. And so, um, and I know you're the same way. So I just, you know, to all of our professors in the room, shout out, you guys do an amazing job. And I've been pushing. Um, I've been pushing some of the. I'm interning at a live at a small rural library, which has been fantastic. Their, their personnel is fantastic, and it really has been a great experience. And I'm where in, are you interning, Warren? I'm at Abbeville County Library. Oh yeah. Yeah. So there's about twenty seven thousand people in the whole county. So there, <laughs> this is a small library, but they make they do a lot with with what they have with their um, small budget, and they do a great job. But I'm always pushing those people that I work with to go to library school. Are you looking to work in a public library? I am. I'm on an archives track, though. Oh, OK. If I'm trying to work with local history and archives stuff. Well, uh, our local history manager just resigned and yeah. retired. Um, I will send a resume tomorrow. Well, there you go. Um, we're all our positions are frozen for the moment because of COVID. But um, she did um, retire. And I just have to echo what you say, and Anne probably has thoughts about it. I don't know where Jess went to library school. Jess, I'm really sorry I can't remember that. But um, I know that um, the culture there, I mean, I graduated in 86. My mother was in the first graduating class of the library school in 73. Wow. And um, it's always been just very warm and inclusive, and you could always knock on doors. I was a grad assistant, and I mean, people are just so nice, and mm -hmm. you know, um, it's not an old profession. It's not like math or English, you know, it's a fairly new profession. Um, and discipline, but um, it has such a rich history at that particular place because of the deans that have been there and they've just been really um, guiding it to be like a family, kind of like it is at the Richland Library when you work there. Um, it just is, yeah, and they, they attract good people. Um, I mean, Valerie's there, Nicole's there. I mean, I know hardly anybody there anymore, but everybody that I hear about, you know, is, um, I hear just really good things. So I'm glad you're having that experience, you know, um, 35 years after I went. <laughs> it's been great yes yeah. and and they're teaching um you know we got a really healthy dose of the technical side of librarianship which i think is super important and um and they don't they don't shy away from any of that um it's about as cutting edge of i, I think of a program as i've ever read about because uh, i've never been to any other programs but but um the, what they're doing at, at u of sc is 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 as advanced, I think, in, as far as a master's degree in librarianship as, as anyone is doing in the country. It, it's really impressive, and they do a great job. Um, and it's great to chat with you. I'm sorry I haven't gotten to meet everybody in our chat. It's so amazing to have these outside visitors that are um, maybe Lissa alumni, but um, but we really appreciate everybody stepping in. And um, uh, we are going to continue to try to make Lissa very vibrant and have more uh, sessions like this in the future. And we will certainly try to get the word out to, to everybody about what those will look like. And so, um, but, but Lissa is, uh, you know, in this new sort of age of the plague, we're having to find new ways to reach out and socialize and, and learn about new things but this has worked out pretty well. And I wanna just thank everybody for stopping by and, and sitting in. And I think we had almost everybody that started with us an hour and 20 minutes ago is still here. So that's kind of amazing, um, especially in something so easy to walk out on. But um, 
unless anyone has any other burning desires, we're going to just kind of sort of wrap this up. Again, thanks, Valerie, for chatting about this stuff. It's fascinating. Again, as an archives person, I don't hear about youth librarianship very often. So this stuff is amazing to me. Well, um, thank you for having me. Yeah, it's been great. Well, they'll, they'll be getting to, now that you've done it once, they'll be tapping you all the time to come back and talk to the list of kids. But, uh, but thanks again for, for, for coming by and um, keep up the good work. Cocky's Reading Express is such an amazing program. And I mean, you look at all that it does and you wonder what the, the illiterate Clemson Tiger does all day. Um, but it's an amazing, and, and I used to get emails and I'm sure that when you guys start doing stuff again, I'd get emails all the time that say meet at the, bu the bus, Cocky's Express is leaving at this time, be there. And you can go visit these kids and, and see real on the ground librarianship and, and interact with these children. So it's an amazing program and I encourage anyone to get involved and I'd love to stay involved after I graduate too, as long as I, as long as I can. Any more uh, questions or comments uh, out there in Lissa land? Uh, we have a survey that Laura put together in chat that we would like everyone to fill out to let us know how this event went or any future events that you would like Lissa to do. And I'll try to put it on our social media pages as well. Thanks, Tamika. Great, great idea. That's from our Laura and Tamika are our social media czars. So they're, they're rocking it out there. Really, thanks a lot for, for bringing that up. Anyone else? Okay, with that, Valerie, thanks again. It's great, Thank to, see, you. It's great to see all y'all out there, even by video chat. So um, everyone have a great night. Happy Thanksgiving. And I hope that you are able to enjoy it responsibly. And I hope I'll be able to talk to you guys all again soon. So good night. Night. Bye. Bye.